there's no specific ICO law. You have to check it in each case. <laughs> Shortly from, uh, to me, I, my name is Benjamin Kirschbaum, a uh, cherry tree in English. I'm a German attorney at law at a Winheller law firm. Um, I actually am doing about 80% of my uh, legal time um, in the cryptocurrency space in about an even split between bank and capital market law and tax law. The other 20% I do church law. This is uh, to, to get down and speak to God and so on after all those cryptocurrency things. Um, Hmm? Yes, if, if, you, if you know his address, no problem. Okay, so um, Wynne and I, we are sitting in Frankfurt, Main, um, Hamburg, Berlin, and some poor guy in Karlsruhe. Uh, I'm sitting in Berlin. Okay, so generally, if you ask uh, two, uh, two lawyers about uh, the same topic, usually you get like three different answers. Today, sadly, not. So I basically agree with everything uh, Osman said. And since we basically are talking about the same things, I will uh, keep uh, the first part short, implement another part, and then talk about uh, taxes, which we all love and like. So, this might work or might not work. Okay, so about the regulation, um, Osman already talked about it. Um, we have no fixed legal framework yet. We have um, some declarations from Bafin saying, if it looks like a security, it probably is a security. If it does not look like a security, it might not be one. We have to check it case by case. So good luck for you. Uh, very nice for us lawyers, because you need to check with us, probably. Yeah? Um, you can see um, the Bafin already warned uh, the public um, um, about ICOs, also um, the European Market Authority said um, ICOs are vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to uh, fraud and money laundering. So, yeah, it might be a uh, PR stand, it most often will be a scam if you lose your money on the ICO. So, we already talked about the different kinds of tokens, like utility tokens, security token. I just want to include uh, the payment tokens because it's uh, important on the next uh, file. It's uh, basically the token that can do absolutely nothing. Uh, that might be a payment token like Bitcoin. You can't do anything with Bitcoin but pay things. So um, Osman already uh, told us what a security under the German Security Act yeah, uh, is. It needs to be transferable, tradable, and must represent some kind of right, like be equivalent to a stock. I just want to add that it must not be a payment instrument. It's specifically in the law saying if it's a payment instrument, it is not a security under the Security Act. So if your token can be classified somehow as a payment instrument, you might fall, not fall under the Security Act. So in your development stage, your ID stage, please keep this in mind if you want to make an ICO. If you structure it as a payment instrument, you might get around this regulation. Payment instrument is, of course, not defined in any law or any regulation, but the general consensus is a payment instrument is an instrument with which you can pay things. Yeah? Uh, pretty easy. So if it's usually used uh, to pay for things at the market, it's a payment instrument. So for established cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether, this might be the case. For your new ICO coin, might not be. Yeah? Osman already talked about what happens if you are security, no insider trading, no market manipulation, especially do not uh, tell people that you win with the money, crash the market, buy everything, and then sell it more expensive. We'll get you straight into jail, next to the Enron guys. Okay, so um, you also might need a prospectus. We already talked about this. If you do not have one or yours is faulty, you will be a civil liable. Um, this is a personal liability, so you cannot shield yourself with a company. If you do not have a prospectus or your prospectus is faulty and somebody sues you, you cannot say, okay, my, my uh, GmbH is now broke, see you, you will be liable personal. So your Maserati and your, no, what is it, Lamborghini will be, um, go to your debt, uh, creditors. Um, one thing Osman did not um, told us about is um, the investment fund. As a uh, Kapitalanlagegesetzbuch, basically, um, Structured Fund Act. 
because you normally will not be an investment fund with your ICO. You, in order to be an investment fund, you need to gather capital to invest this capital according to some kind of strategy to the benefit of your investors. This is usually not the case because uh, with an ICO, you gather money to finance your own development, your own production, your own product, to not um, invest the money in some cases. Yeah, But it may be the case if you issue a token, let's say um, the rare stamps token, and your intention is to get, uh, take the money from your investors to invest it in rare postal stamps. And the value of your token is described as a uh, or goes up as the value of your stamps go up. This might be actually be an investment fund. Yeah. So in that case, you need to adhere to all those rules um, from the KAGB, which are not that strict, but um, you basically need some kind of partner bank for your ICO because you can't do it yourself in general. Also, there's the Investment Act. Vermögensanlagengesetz in Germany, which we also have not talked about yet. So this is a lot of stuff in there, which might be a, an investment. For ICOs, the most important is the first one, shares that allow participation of the operating result of a business. So if you offer in your ICO some kind of token that says, okay, I have this great business idea, and if you invest in my token and my business idea booms, and I will pay you some profit share yeah, without any ownership rights or something, just the promises of uh, participating in the profit, you are probably an investment and you need an investment prospectus. Also trust assets, if your company wants to hold some real things, let's say um, precious metals, and your, the ICO, the token represents some kinds of those pre precious metals, you invest in it then, and you hold it for trust. Then also Investment Act, Investment Prospectus. There's also a profit participating loan. It's one about the same as the first one. So I, I, um, I promise you for my token, you get a fixed dividend. Yeah, It's uh, Genussrechte in Germany. Um, yeah, there's also other investments um, that offer or advertise interest payment and so on, which was included after the Procon um, scandal, um, and it basically shall include everything not covered in the first six numbers. Yeah. So if you um, a real world example would be um, ship containers. If you offer ship containers, you, you sell it, sell them for ten thousand euros, and you say, okay, I lend those ship containers for you to some kind of um, um, ship and they pay interest and you get some of those interest and later I sell the ship container back to you for, or for, for the money. Um, this is basically still an investment and you can do this in an ICO somehow if you want, but then you need an investment prospectus. All right. Um, so this is basically the legal consequences, already talked about that. Um, and we also talked about that there's no specific ICO law, there's no specific definition of security token, utility token, payment token. You have to check it in each case. There is light at the end of the tunnel for the prospectus regulation of the EU in 2017. There is the possibility for the member states to exclude offerings of up to 8 million euros from prospectus requirements. And it seems that the German law lawmaker wants to include um, this exemption in the German laws. So if you want to make an ICO and you intend to only gather up to 8 million euros, it might be advisable to wait a little bit and then you do not need the prospectus. You only need some kind of information brochure, about two pages, which you need to send to the BaFin and uh, they sign it off and you can go ahead. Yeah? Much easier than a whole prospectus. Next would be um, taxes. Before I talk about taxes, I want to get to some civil law stuff because you talked about that um, for venture capitalists, it's uh, much easier to trade your ownership rights with a token 
than in a normal usual way. And I beg to differ because if you have a security token that's actually an ownership right in a company, you still would have to um, adhere to the civil requirements of transfer of those ownerships. Yeah, so if you have a GmbH and your security tokens shall be a share of, those, of this GmbH, in order to transfer your token, you actually would have to run to a, not a notary and get it signed off. So this is basically not liquid at all. Also, if you have a, a AG and you, uh, your token shall be a stock, then th either your stock is traded on a regulated exchange, e.g. Deutsche Börse, or since there was a stock reform in 2016, if your stocks are not traded on a regulated exchange, they must be registered by name. So you need a name register of all your stockholders. And you can't just, your stockholders can't just transfer those things because they need to inform you this is the buyer and you need to write this off in your name register. So this is also not very liquid. The best ICO variant that I can think of is um, the silent participa participator. So basically the Stille Gesellschaft in Germany because there is basically no legal requirement to get a Stille, a Stille Gesellschaft. You can just found it. It does not need to be registered anywhere because it's still and you can um, transfer it however you want. So th this is the most e easiest thing under a civil law perspective for your ICO token. All right. So let's see about uh, taxation. First, let's see utility tokens. If you offer a utility token, we found out it's the most easiest for your re from the regulatory perspective. But from the tax perspective, it's actually um, rather disastrous because if you sell a utility token, it does not differ from the sale of any other goods and service. So if your company sells a lot of apples and gets a lot of proceedings, you would have to pay taxes on the, the, those proceedings. Yeah. S same with an ICO. So let's say you make your ICO, you get uh, 20 million dollars, you have to pay 30% uh, corporate tax on those um, 20 millions, which sucks. Yeah. The possible solutions would be either a more difficult approach would be um, you make provisions for liabilities. So if your utility token is actually um, giving the ICO investor some kind of right against your company, like you offer some kind of product or service, let's say um, what's uh, the normal things, um, cloud data storage, yeah, your example, let's say um, everybody who has this token can come to you and make um, store their data on your cloud and you have costs for that, you can make provisions for those future liabilities, which will offset some of your gains. So this would reduce your tax burden. But in order to have, um, be allowed to make such pro provisions, your white paper or whatever contract you use um, with your ICO investors needs to really specify those possible claims of your investors. If you just make some uh, three-page white paper which says, yeah, I want to do cloud storage, you do not have this option. It needs to be really defined and it needs, needs to be more probable that those liabilities come due than not. The easier, um, easier variant would be to make your ICO not by a for-profit company, but by a non-profit foundation. You first found a non-profit foundation which wants to further uh, science and industry by researching blockchain stuff. Yeah? This non-profit foundation does not pay corporate tax. So then you make a GmbH under those foundation and pay, the foundation can then pay the GmbH for the actual development of your token and the business case and so on. So this would be probably the advised method to get around income tax. Sure. Utility tokens and value added tax. Um, yeah, so the European Court of Justice and the Hedquist um, judgment said that um, tokens that can only be used for payment are exempt from the VAT. This is, um, Mr. Hedquist uh, got this judgment, so please send him an, a love letter. He's a very cool guy. And um, so if 
your token that you issue can only be used as payment, your ICO is value added tax free, basically. So also the um, German Minister of Finance just uh, sent out a note to all um, fi finance agencies basically saying yes, please uh, do so. But if your utility token actually has utility, this exempt exemption might not be um, applicable. Because let's say um, you have um, the right to cloud storage, it's not just a payment token. You have some actual right to do stuff. Therefore, no VAT exemption under the European Court of Justice rule. There might be other exemptions. For example, if your token is actually representing gold, you are probably not um, VAT exempt like every other gold coin, nugget, um, ingot. There's also the possibility to, or at least you can think about it, that your tokens are actually vouchers. So let's st uh, stick to the um, cloud storage thing. If your token um, allows you to uh, store things in the cloud, this might be counted as a voucher against your company. So you issue the voucher and they can take it and then come to your service. If this is a one-way voucher, like in this case, um, you have just this specific thing that you can do, it will, be, um, will not be VAT exempt. You will have to pay the normal VAT on it because everybody can say, okay, this is the one good or service, service that you buy with your token. Therefore, we know everything we need to know to um, put a VAT on it. If it's a multi-way voucher, let's say your company offers three different products, and one voucher is worth like one tenth of each product and nobody really knows which product the customer will use. Then it's a multi-way voucher and that is a VAT exempt in the moment of the sale. The VAT will only be called upon if the voucher is actually called. So if the customer comes to you, says here is my uh, token, please give me stuff, then you have to pay VAT on it. So therefore your ICO would at least be um, VAT exempt. Problem, if it's not VAT exempt, under EU VAT guidelines, if you offer your goods or services or services as electronic services, which basically is an ICO because you do not offer your ICO on paper but via the internet, you will have to pay the VAT at the place of the residence of the consumer. Good luck. Yeah, you need to find, really find out where all your investors sit. Then you have to go to the mini one-stop shop, the MOS, and tell them, here's my VAT for my consumers in Italy. This is not good because in, in most cases you have no clue who your investors are. If you, so even if you are not required un under anti-money laundering law to identify your customers, it might be advisable from a tax perspective. Because otherwise you are due VAT in like uh, 26 European states, you do not pay a dime you can close your business in two years because uh, everybody will hunt you down. Yeah, don't do that. Equity, yeah, please. Yeah, um, maybe you're covering the data. Uh, KYC. Is that something you want to follow up? I, I won't, actually. That it's have a for you. sure. <laughs> um, where does the KYC obligation come from, and how may it be different with the token models? Oh, the KYC um, requirement and our customers is under anti-money laundering guidelines. So basically. Um, if you are, fall under the Banking Act, which Osman talked about, or the Payment Service um, Act, which Osman talked about, or you are selling goods, yeah, then you are anti-money laundering um, required. Then you need to uh, do your know your customer regulations. Yeah? So basically, at the start of any business um, activity, you need to identify um, your customer. Yeah? If you are, do neither of those things, you are not... Um, AML required. Yes? Okay. Um, for an equity token, it's easy. There's not any more on this, um, on this slide. Since they're equity or debt, there's neither in any income tax and there's also no VAT yeah? in most cases. So all in all, if you want to make an ICO, do a utility token. You do not have to make any regulatory requirements, but the tax burden is pretty bad. If you do an equity token, you have much higher costs in the front up because you need prospectus and so on and so on, but you do not pay any taxes on it. 
So this is basically what you need to think about before you go and make your ICO. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, my question would be you uh, said a very interesting thing about the something about payment instruments, but what is actually the definition of a payment instrument? Because basically you can define every token as a payment instrument. This means really the question who's accepting this instrument. So what is the definition regarding ICOs on payment instruments um, to classify the reader as security or not? Yeah, um, what I said, there is no definition of payment instrument. Um, the only thing you can find in the uh, literature is um, things you can pay with, um, which are usually used to pay with. So they say, um, basically, um, the, the euros you have in your bank account are payment instruments, any cash you have is a, bank, uh, is a payment instrument, any um, check, checks are a payment instrument, for, uh, for, for cryptocurrencies, there's basically guesswork. So if, if I would go to the Baffin and say, okay, my thing looks like a, um, like a security token, but in actual, actuality, it's a payment instrument because it's used to pay for things, and it's usually used for pay, uh, to pay for things. I would just uh, try this approach. Maybe it works. Yeah? But it's, it's really hard to make an actual definition because there is none. You, could, you should just uh, try it in your... I mean, you can't lose anything. You just say, hey, it's a payment instrument, and Buffin says, yeah, it's a payment instrument, and then it's great. If it says, no, it's no, uh, not one, you say, okay, it's not one. Do you know if there has been a case who actually tried this? So, no. I mean, we, we, are currently, uh, we currently have a, a lot of ICOs, and maybe we can convince somebody to try it, but uh, yeah. Any other question? Uh, maybe it's a stupid one, but back to page 15 where we were talking about VAT. Um, so did I get you right that at a certain point, every utility token issue, issuer uh, needs to know their customer? Uh, only if you need to pay a VAT. Yeah. Okay, but at the latest, when they actually use and they actually want to get uh, use their utility token and want the utility from you, yeah. That's actually the point where you need to know your customer, then, if I get you right. Yeah, if, if uh, the thing they can use it for is also an electronic service. Yeah. yeah Let's say the cloud service would be an electronic service, so yeah. then. Yeah. But in that case, you might, yeah, at, at least uh, then you, you need to know your customer, obviously. Yes. In, okay. order to identify, not... in order to identify to which member state of the EU you have to pay a VAT. Because if you don't, you can't pay your VAT. Then... So, like, does this mean actually then? If you want to do an ICO with a real utility token and you expect the utility to get really actually used at some certain point, you can't do it in the EU right now. Oh, you, you can. You just need to know. Yeah, but you can't know every of you. Oh, yeah, why not? I mean, Amazon knows everybody of its customers. Amazon yeah, so blockchain is. I mean, you do not need, actually, okay, so the requirement is not to know your customer by name. That is not required. There are, in the EU regulation, uh, four. Um, things you need to know and you need to know at least two of those four in order to identify your customer. This is, if he is using your service from a stationary cell phone, like some cell phone box outside, you can assume he is there in this cell phone box and therefore you know the country code of the cell phone box, you can pay it there. Okay, won't happen. If he's using it from a open Wi-Fi in some hotel or so, you can assume he's in that hotel. So, to, to, um, Another thing is uh, IP address. If you know your, the IP address of your customer, you can assume, if you have another um, of those, um, um, so those things, that he is residing where the IP address uh, stems from. If you also, if you need to, if you, if you have to send him or send him a bill, so he says, okay, I, I live at wherever, please send my bill to there, you can assume he's living there. If, you also have, if his ID address, IP, IP address uh, matches. If his IP address is from Island and he says, please send the bill to Spain, you are out. You don't know where he lives. And this uh, last um, thing is any other economic um, identification, which is uh, basically whatever you can find. Yeah? So if you, if you do not have any of those um, identification things, um, the EU says uh, try harder. Yeah, that is basically what is uh, stating in the guideline to this. Okay, but let's say that's the first problem, right? to actually get the chance to actually know your customer. And even, even when you somehow figure it out, 
you somehow figure out who your actually customers are, those 25 million different ones spread all over the world, um, then the second step you need to do is you need to contact the local institution to pay actually the VAT. Oh no, you, you have the mini one-stop shop, which is uh, the Bundeszentrale für Steuer in ah, Germany. Okay. You just tell them, you just uh, send oh, all okay. the money to them and, ah, they, okay. and they have the work. Ah, that's yeah. very well. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I would like to see how they check every 25 million. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually don't, actually, I, I think. So you just say, yeah, it's probably doing here. So it would be advisable to have a lot of customers from the United States because you do not have to pay VAT in the United States. But it sucks from a regulatory standpoint because then the SEC will come and hunt you down. Yeah? So you are either fire or frying pan. Okay. So the idea was to multiply the people who are doing SEOs. Yeah, please do it too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Benjamin and Benjamin Sales.